Well, good morning to you. Happy Thursday. Uh, it's a beautiful day outside. It was 70 degrees outside this morning and uh, just cool and crisp and the way you love it, right? This is the perfect time of year to be in Vail, Arizona. Uh, God's richest grace to you this morning. Hope you slept well. Uh, hope you have a great day. Um, it is Thursday, September 24th. And uh, we are in the book of Genesis and uh, have a, uh, this, is, um, this is a little bit of a pre-recording this morning because uh, I have something else that I'm doing at 7 o'clock this morning. Uh, and so this is just a, uh, a pre-recorded Bible study. Um, so for those of you that watch live, um, this, this isn't live. It's actually an hour earlier than live. <laughs> Um, but it's still a beautiful day. The train's going by. The sun is just about to come up, and it is absolutely beautiful. Uh, no, uh, no, um, uh, what do I want to call it? No uh, birthdays today. Uh, but uh, I wanted to look at the Hard Things Conference and see what we got going on. Uh, I think there's one tonight. Yeah, at 5.30 p.m., um, there is going to be one called God looks amazing on you with Amy Seifert. God looks amazing on you. If ever there was a time for grace, it's now. The complexity of our daily lives, they overwhelm us, they surround us, and the uncertainty of what's next can easily weigh us down. What if we tried on grace? What does that look like in our daily life? National speaker and author Amy Seifert will begin to give us five key takeaways on swimming in grace instead of drowning in guilt. So that's at uh, 5.30 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. Uh, it's going to be a great time. Amy is an author, writer, teacher. She is currently on the teaching team at Brookside Cheech Church, where she also directs community groups and the staff team. She also has been an affiliate uh, Campus Crusade staff member for more than 18 years, weaving biblical wisdom through her presentations. Amy inspires, teaches, and humbly invites any willing spiritual pilgrim to walk alongside her in the pursuit of truth and the knowledge of God. Amy is married to Rob, and they both live in Bowling Green, Ohio. So this will be a great um, connection tonight. Uh, it starts at 5.30. You will want to watch this. Absolutely no question. Is it going to be a great, great, great uh, presentation. Go to hardthingsconference.com, uh, hardthingsconference.com, sign up, RSVP, that gets you to the Zoom link, and then at 5.30, join it. And it, these have been really, really, really great um, opportunities. Uh, they, uh, they are just really, really, really good. And uh, so if you've missed any of them, you go back and take a look at a few of them. They are, they're going to be, they, well, they have been great teachings, and tonight's going to be a great teaching also. So, um, and like I said, no birthdays today, uh, but we are, in the, we are in the middle of Genesis, actually towards the tail end of Genesis. And we left it yesterday that Joseph, who was sold into slavery uh, and is now Pharaoh's number two and is in the middle of a pandemic, uh, they're in year two of a seven-year pandemic. They just finished year two of a seven-year pandemic. Um, you talk about our pandemic lasting six months or nine months or whatever it's going to last. Can you imagine having famine for nine years? And if you hadn't prepared for it, how horrible that would be. All the death, all the destitution, all the despair, all the anger. But because God revealed to Pharaoh in a dream that this pandemic was coming and because Joseph was able to interpret that dream, uh, Pharaoh is well prepared. And Joseph is a hero, but Pharaoh looks like a hero too because he's the one that listened to Joseph and put Joseph in charge. And, um, you know, that's what a great leader does, right? They, they uh, you know, they put things into action and make sure things happen at the right time. So, uh, and Pharaoh is a good leader. So, anyway, um, uh, but back in Cana, the famine was so severe that Jacob's 11 brothers came to Jake, or came to jo Joseph's 11 brothers came to Joseph to get food. Joseph immediately recognized them, sent them away, said, bring back Benjamin. So they brought back Benjamin. Uh, and now uh, Joseph planted his own silver cup in Benjamin's sack. They were a day's journey away when uh, Pharaoh's team caught up with them and said, why have you stolen this cup? They brought it back. 
Uh, they, and then um, Joseph reveals himself to his brothers. And his brothers are terrified. And of course, they should be terrified because the, what of, of what they did to Joseph. But Joseph is a mature, faithful man of God who um, takes a large look at life and understands that adversity is always going to happen. Bad things are always going to happen. Uh, but God is still present in this world. And if you take, back, uh, take a step back and just look at the big picture, you can see... As Joseph said, what you meant for evil, God meant for good, uh, which yesterday we spent a little bit of time about how I thought that that was the best way to live your life, is to look at all the things that look like evil, and they are some of them are evil, but God can take even evil things and turn them into good things uh, because he is a great and amazing God. He's got all the power of the universe at his fingertips. He's got angels at the ready, uh, and... Um, and as we grow in our faith, as we view the world around us and grow in our faith, um, we can start to see how God's amazing grace unfolds in the world around us. And we can look for those touch points of grace about how God uh, uses even some of the most horrible things. Like what are some of the horrible things going on right now, right? We have rioting going on. We have the death of a Supreme Court justice going on. We have this pandemic going on. We have economic hardship going on. Uh, we have relationships in turmoil going on. We have, uh, this morning I'm gonna go uh, give my love and support to one of our board members who's going in for a stem cell therapy this morning. Um, and uh, it, it is, you know, we have, we have cancer. But God's grace is still present. His spirit is still present in this world. And when you are able to maturely in your faith look around, you begin to see how God still is active and at work and is doing amazing things even in the most difficult situations. That's what Paul found out. When Paul was in prison, you'd think that he would be despaired because uh, he couldn't uh, start new, new churches or you know travel as a missionary to new locations and start churches. But God, but God was able to use Paul wherever Paul was. If Paul was in a prison, God used Paul in a prison. Uh, if, if he was uh, injured on an island, he, God was able to use him injured. And the same thing with uh, the Apostle John who was imprisoned on the island of Patmos. God was still able to use him. God is still able, as long as you have breath in your lungs, uh, and even if you don't, I mean, I was going to say, as long as you have, uh, you know, uh, your, your wits about you. But I've seen God use uh, people who don't who are under dementia. I've been, I've been able to see God do amazing things in those situations also. God can do all things through, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And God can turn any situation into a blessing and grace. Um, and that's what I believe Joseph knew by the end of his life when he's finally Pharaoh's number two and doing what he's supposed to do, what God had called him to do, this great administrative task. Um, God was able to be used mightily by Joseph. And as long as you have breath, God is able to mightily use you. And it might be in big ways. It might be small ways. It might be uh, in ways that only you know about and God knows about and nobody else knows about. But all those things God treasures in his heart and keeps them safe until we see him face to face. And then he reveals all of his plan to us. And uh, we get to see how we were part of just a little part of amazing things that God was able to do in this world. So that's kind of where we left it yesterday. Um, so uh, we're going to continue on the story. We are in Genesis uh, 45, I believe. Let me just look here. Yeah, Genesis 45. Beginning, we'll just begin at verse 8. Um, so... Verse 8, so then it was not you who sent me here, but God. He made me father to Pharaoh, lord of his entire household and ruler of all of Egypt. Now hurry back to my father and say to him, this is what your son Joseph says. God has made me lord of all Egypt. Come down to me, don't delay. You shall live in the region of Goshen and be near me, you, your children and your grandchildren, your flocks and herds and all you have. I will provide for you there because five years of famine are still to come. Otherwise, you and your household and all who belong to you will become destitute. You can see for yourselves, and so can my brother Benjamin. 
that it is really I who am speaking to you. Tell my father about all the honor accorded me in Egypt and about everything you have seen and bring my father down here quickly. So this is as if uh, here in the United States, somebody was living in the White House or living in one of the, you know, the presidential, vice presidential, you know, secretary cabinet position houses that are very, very close to Washington, D.C. Uh, and you're now, maybe it's not the president, maybe it's the vice president, maybe you are connected to, you know, the prime minister is a better way to think about this because Pharaoh is like the king or the queen and Joseph is like the prime minister. We don't have that system of government here. We have a king, we, have, we don't have a king, we have a president. Um, and I guess, uh, I don't know, in our, in our circumstances, the president is also the chief executive. So he has a dual role. Um, so, but it'd be, it'd be like, uh, if the, if the president, a chief of staff, there you go. That's what it is. Um, if, if you were the chief of staff to the president of the United States and you had a, a house right next to the white house, um, and, and you found out that your, you know, long lost son who you thought was dead was now chief of staff to the president of the United States. And he says, I want you to come live with me. You'd probably do it. Right. Because he has a position of power and influence, well loved by the people. Although, could have been a you know, once you get into politics, nobody's well loved by everybody. Um, and here in the United States, man, it seems like uh, it is getting worse and worse and worse. Uh, where half the people love the current administration, half the people hate the current administration. Uh, and I say this to everybody: no president is as good as their side says. And no president is as bad as the other side says. They're all human beings. They have some good traits. They have some bad traits. They're deeply flawed in some instances, but they have some good. Uh, they, they don't get elected unless there is some ability within them that's seen by the people of the United States. So these people that become our leaders deserve um, a looking at and a respect at some level uh, no matter who they are, because they, uh, they are our leaders. Um, we get deeply polarized here in the United States. Um, and as a matter of fact, uh, we can get so polarized that it splits families apart. And uh, let me tell you something, no politics should ever f split apart a family, my friends. Uh, your family and blood runs a whole lot deeper than politics. And your faith and... Uh, and the way that God works in your in your life should be primary anyway. The fact that you're in the kingdom should be first and foremost. Seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. Um, and if you if you do that and you put politics as secondary, it puts the right perspective on what politics is. I cannot believe how many people on both sides of the aisle uh, put politics like. Everything revolves around politics. It's the most important, like who's in charge uh, and, you know, of your particular group or tribe. Um, if, uh, if they're not in power, um, then the world is falling apart. And when they are po in power, the world is c coming together greatly. Um, no, there is no perfect leader, my friends. Um, there are only imperfect people uh, doing what they've been elected to do. And so... Um, it's a, it's a, a lot of people think that the United States, I happen to be one of them, think it's the, the representative form of democracy is the greatest way to lead right now. There may be other ways in the future that we can figure this out with the technology, right? Maybe we can really figure it out. Um, but right now, representative democracy seems like the best way to go. And so um, I, I'm very proud of the United States. I'm very proud of that we've been able to hold it together in the midst of all sorts of things uh and but please don't don't make politics the number one thing in your life you are a child of the king the king is the number one thing in your life and just no matter where you are in the world god can use you uh, in the situations of the world around you to bring his love and peace and grace and it doesn't matter who's in the white house or who's in the senate or who's in the congress or who's on the supreme court all of that is secondary to the fact that you are a child of the king and you know you could be in a corrupt government um, and be in prison for a reason that is not even fair uh, and still have God use you in amazing ways. We've seen that across the world and across time also.
All right. So, um, of course, they're going to go with Joseph. We'll continue reading. Verse 12. You can see for yourself, and so can my brother Benjamin, that is really I. Bring my father down. Yeah, so we, we'll go to verse 14 here. I'll bring it up to the top. Then Joseph threw his arms around his brother Benjamin and wept. And Benjamin embraced him weeping, and he kissed all his brothers, and he wept over them. And afterwards, his brothers talked with him. And when the news reached Pharaoh's palace that Joseph's brothers had come, Pharaoh and all his officials were pleased. Pharaoh said to Joseph, tell your brothers, do this, load your animals and return to the land of Canaan and bring your father and your families back to me. I will give you the best of the land of Egypt and you can enjoy the fat of the land. Verse 19, you are also directed to tell them, do this. Take some carts from Egypt for your children and your wives and get your father to and come. Never mind about your belongings because the best of all of Egypt will be yours. So this is um, Pharaoh's grace. I don't know if Joseph expected this. Uh, Joseph thought that he would come and maybe from his earnings or whatever put his father up. But once Pharaoh hears about that Joseph has family, he says, of course, absolutely, you have to go get your family. And don't even worry about bringing your things. Bring them here and we will make you, um, we will give you all that we can in Egypt. That's how much Pharaoh loved Joseph. Think about it. Pharaoh loved Joseph so much, he's willing to just go and get all of Joseph's family, bring them back to Egypt and take care of them. And that is a huge, huge, huge blessing. But it's also a curse. Because... We're going to have generations of people that are now being taken care of by Pharaoh. And a switch is going to happen between Genesis and Exodus, where at first they become uh, prized members of Pharaoh's court. As different Pharaohs come along, they become slaves in Pharaoh's court. So um, while there's things, you know, that, what, little lurking in the background behind this kindness and grace of this Pharaoh is the fact that future pharaohs uh, do not feel as highly dedicated to Joseph and his family as the original pharaoh did. Because if you do not earn it yourself, if you have somebody else taking care of you, uh, it's easy to become lazy and content uh, and in slavery. And you say, wait, no, we live in a free America. Yeah, we live in a free America. But if you are not taking care of yourself, if you are not using the gifts that God has given you, to do whatever you can to take, and I understand there's destitute people and all that, but this was a whole tribe of people. Um, if you're not taking care of yourself, you're in slavery, my friends. Uh, now, it ends up becoming real slavery in Pharaoh's court, but but if you're not taking care of yourself, then you're enslaved to somebody else. Just thought I'd throw, throw that out there. So verse 21. So the sons of Israel did this. Joseph gave them carts as Pharaoh had commanded. And he also gave them provisions for the journey. To each of them, he gave new clothing. But to Benjamin, he gave 300 shekels of silver and five sets of clothes. And this is what he sent to his father. Ten donkeys loaded with the best things of Egypt. Ten female donkeys loaded with grain and bread and other provisions for his journey. Then he sent his brothers away. And as they were leaving, he said to them, don't quarrel on the way. Oh, my goodness. So Joseph remembers how his brothers would quarrel. Of course they would quarrel. Eleven boys, you know, they used to fight each other on the ground and then they used to argue about things. And Joseph's like, don't quarrel anymore. You have no reason to quarrel. Of course, Joseph can't stop him from quarreling. Of course they're going to quarrel. They're eleven brothers. Do you stop quarreling with your brothers and sisters just because you get older? Ha. Verse 25. So they went up out of Egypt and came to their father Jacob in the land of Canaan. They told him, Joseph is still alive. In fact, he is ruler of all of Egypt. Jacob was stunned. He did not believe them. But when they told him everything Joseph had said to them, and when he saw the carts Joseph had sent to carry him back, the spirit of their father Jacob revived. And Israel said, I'm convinced my son Joseph is still alive. I will go and see him before I die. I would have loved to have been a part of that conversation, a fly on the wall there. Because they'd have to lay out the whole thing, how they sold him into... I mean, it's going to come out. 
We sold him into slavery. We went to, we sold him to Ishmaelites. They took him into Egypt. He went into Potiphar's court. He went into prison. He interpreted Pharaoh's dream, became Pharaoh's number two. And daddy's not angry about it. He sees this as part of God's plan. Um, and Jacob, who loved his son Joseph, gets to see his son before he dies. He gets to, so he's back, he's returned back to, this is the story of Job, right? Job, who lost his whole entire family, that God allowed Satan to rip apart his whole entire family, and at the end of his life, he was, all of this was restored. Because God, every once in a while, God does amazing things for his grace and for his love, and that's what he does for Jacob. Uh, so Jacob is going to go back to Egypt, be reunited with Joseph, not only be reunited with Joseph, but be the esteemed father of uh, the chief of staff of the President of the United States, go to all the parties, tell all the stories, tell about Abraham, Isaac, his brother, um, Esau, uh, all of this stuff, all these blessings at the end of his life. I mean, Jacob truly is living a blessed life because of God. But God said to Jacob, I'm going to make you a blessing so that you can be a blessing to other people. Um, and this, And the story of Joseph is just one way that God made the heir of Jacob be a blessing to the world around. And everybody is blessed here because of Jacob. And Jacob has an amazing ability to get things done, to be connected with God. Uh, and um, it's amazing when it only takes one person in a family to do the right thing for the right reason. And then the whole family becomes blessed because of it, right? Um, so uh, when you do the right things, your when God allows you to bless the world around you, um, that permeates society and it brings blessing and honor to your whole entire tribe. And that is a really cool thing. Uh, and so uh, Jacob is going to go to Egypt. So um, I think we'll leave it there. Um, we'll go into chapter 46 tomorrow. Uh, and we have 46, 47, 48, 49, 50. So we have five more chapters um, and when I say tomorrow, I don't mean tomorrow. Uh, today is Thursday, September 24th, and um, tomorrow is Friday. I'm not here tomorrow, so you get the day off. Then we have, mon then we have Sunday, Monday. Uh, now, don't forget, on Sunday, immediately after worship, is what we're calling Community Sunday. And uh, we are, right after the worship service, there's a link that you can click onto uh, and you get onto a Zoom call, and then once everybody's on the Zoom call, then we break apart into groups, uh, and you get to just fellowship with each other. And it's a lot of fun. Um, the people that I've talked to that have been a part of this call just absolutely love it. Uh, it's a great way to connect people because we can't see each other face to face. Uh, and then the other question I keep getting asked is uh, how soon before you know we start getting together? And uh, it won't be in the month of October. Um, it could be in the month of November. Uh, I think we're investigating that and trying to see if that makes sense. Uh, but for a number of reasons, October isn't, isn't the right time. So for those of you who are curious about that, um, it's, it's, uh, we do still do communion. Um, uh, and in October, the last month of October is going to be our communion Sunday. And because it's so beautiful outside and because apparently being outside is not as much of an issue on communion Sunday, which is going to be the last Sunday in October, which is October 25th, I believe. We're all going to gather together as a congregation uh, in the courtyard uh, at the Mod Quad and have a worship service and communion. So we're planning that right now. We haven't really launched it. So I'm probably uh, speaking a little bit out of turn yet. <laughs> we have another week before we're going to actually announce this publicly. But since you are all part of my Bible study, and because I love you all, I'm giving you the secret skinny on that, all right? <laughs> um, but don't forget to join us for Community Sunday, this Sunday. And then we'll have a live in-person Community Sunday a month from now. Uh, and then after that, I think we'll start seeing things break apart uh, in ways that I think God's going to be able to bless us. Uh, we're looking at how that, how we can do that. So um, I think we'll go ahead and close in prayer. Dear God, thank you for the blessing of today. Uh, thank you for people like Joseph that you did amazing things through. Um, help us to be your hands and feet no matter what the situation. Watch over us today in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. So um, there you go. Uh, 
Thanks for joining me today and uh, have a great day. And we will talk to you later. God's peace. Bye.